I'm here today speaking with Professor Diane O'Dowd from the Department of Developmental and Cell Biology. Welcome, Diane. Thank you. You are an award-winning teacher. You've gotten the Senate Award for Teaching. And one of the reasons that you got that award was because of this kind of a revolution that you've been starting in bio-teaching. You have managed to make very large classes with 400 students and fixed seating in a lecture hall very active and interactive. What made you think that you needed to change your teaching? Well, that's really a question that has many different answers, but I think the most uh, fundamental issue that came to me was I realized I was bored and unhappy <laughs> in teaching in a classroom where I was the talking head and I was giving out information and getting nothing back. And there were two reasons I was getting nothing back. One is that even when I would stop to ask for questions, I became uncomfortable if nobody said anything. So you know that dead space. Exactly. So I'd answer their questions. So they quickly learned that, well, they didn't really have to um, answer any questions because I would answer all mm -hmm. of them. And the second was that it's um, in a very large classroom. It's um, really difficult to do, to um, get people to actually um, talk to their neighbors and interact because most of the time you're telling them not to. You're saying, right. you know, be quiet, listen to me. Mm -hmm. And so then if I would ever ask the students to do that in a large classroom, it was very foreign and uncomfortable to them. And I felt like we, I had to change the way I taught sort of overall to get some more feedback from my students because it was really quite boring, after, especially after teaching the same class maybe for five or six years in a row. I know the material like that. I'm just delivering information and they're sitting there. So that's one reason. It was really uninteresting for me. The second reason is because I realized as my children got to the age where they were starting to think about where did they want to go to college, we started looking into what kinds of um, classes they might be attending when they went to college. And I realized that if they went to a college and came to attend a class like the one I'd been teaching, <laughs> they might not be very interested in it. <laughs> so in the end, those were the two sort of major reasons that I thought it would be um, good to at least try it. And you also picked up a few pointers, I believe, from the Howard Hughes Institute? Oh yeah, that was absolutely essential to me doing this. Actually, I had previously, uh, um, in, I had taught very large classes for a number of years. Then I went down to a smaller class, 80 to 90 here as a small class, as you know. And I had come to the Learning Resource Center and taken a few seminars on actually um, active engagement exercises that you can do in a class. And I tried them in my small classes. They worked great. It was made teaching for me. It satisfied the one need. Teaching for me was got to be very much more fun because I got interaction with my students and they interacted with each other. But the majority of our classes, the w place where we have a big influence is on, I think, on freshmen. Mm -hmm. And you only see them in very large classes. So I wanted to teach, use these techniques, but in a very large class. And I just thought, I have no idea how to do this. And I went to an institute um, in Wisconsin run by Joe Handelsman and uh, colleagues associated with the Howard Hughes professorship she had. And that they showed me how you can actually employ active learning in a very large classroom. Relatively simple tricks and techniques, but um, when I saw that it was possible that for somebody else to do, then I knew that I could do it. Mm -hmm. I might not be able to do it exactly the way they did, but I would be able to use their ideas and strategies in my own 
um, twist on them in my classrooms here. And of course, sometimes even just a little change can have a huge impact on a class. Yes, that's really true. I think research would suggest that um, a little change from the very beginning of the class is the way you need to do it. Like I said before, I taught in these very large classes and then, duh, nobody says anything when I ask them a question because for the first three lectures, I never asked them a question. And so you don't, and being very upfront with the students, telling them, this is the type of classroom I have and this is why I have it this way. I've made this decision that I believe that you will learn more by actually doing something in class, working with the material, practicing it by speaking with each other, mm -hmm. speaking with me, than you will if you just sit there and listen. And so um, the majority of you will gain a lot from this. There will be a small percentage of you that still learn better by reading out of the book. Mm -hmm. So bear with us because we're trying to um, get a heterogeneous group satisfied. So we use lots of techniques. So if you find one that works, use it. Other ones that you feel aren't as helpful for you, that don't worry, that you don't have to find everything we do equally helpful. When you say it like that, then the students are really on board with you, that there will be students that wish you did less interactive stuff, mm -hmm. and there are students that wish you did more. Both have to be tolerant of the fact that there is, in every classroom, especially a classroom of 444 freshmen, a wide range of learning styles, background knowledge, and comfort with doing different types of things. And you're right, the research does in fact support that if you let the students know why you're doing something, they're much more likely to participate, to engage, and to be invested in the process as well. Right, so I had I have had extremely good success with that. <laughs> well, but I had one funny comment this year where somebody said, well, I said, you know, and now we um, turn in these cards that you just did because I'm going to assess how this um, uh, activity went. And he said, well, if you don't know by now and you've been doing this for four years, you probably aren't <laughs> doing it right. And I said, but I don't, we don't we don't do the same thing every year because we found something didn't work the past year, then we will do something new. So I'm not sure I convinced him, but I think the other 443 students <laughs> felt okay that they turned in their cards. Now you've also been influencing the next generation of professors in your work with teaching assistants, and you were even honored for that as well last year at the celebration of teaching. What sort of impact has this training program that you've created for TAs had on them in terms of their thinking about their teaching and also the undergraduates that they work with? Yeah, the TA training program that we have, I think, has been uh, very successful um, due in a large part to the fact that we've had some fabulous graduate students that have been involved with us, as well as PhD level um, discussion leaders. And they've all basically decided this is something they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So they get the choice to actually indicate that this is um, an activity that they'd like to participate in. That has um, really helped in terms of um, getting people that are open-minded and um, they probably were mostly taught in large lecture classes that were mostly didactic, but they are generally people that um, are more visual, tactile uh, learners, at, at least when we do our learning assessments, that's how the majority of them come up. And they then really are um, amazed by the kinds of uh, changes that you see in the classroom when you get the students to do an activity rather than lecturing at them. Uh, this year we had a few students that actually were assigned and did not elect to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's a way less effective program for, stu for people who um, either don't want to teach in any way, shape, or form, but have to because <laughs> that is part of their job, or they've already taught for a number of years, and our program is geared at taking people who really haven't taught before. And so 
it's to expose them to a broad range of styles and techniques and allow them to choose what works for them. Because I've had so many people say, you know, I'm not a natural teacher. I'm not like you. I couldn't go up there and, you know, do a demonstration where I have to be kinesin. And I say, oh my God, you know, 10 years ago, you would have never, I would have never imagined myself doing that either. And that is also a style that, that has developed out of what I've been doing. I didn't jump in and start that way. So I can show you some small steps to take and then you can de decide where your comfort level lies because student, it won't work for the students or for you if you're trying to do something that is outside of your personality. Yeah, I think that's also very true in the TA training that we do as well. Uh, but it does give the graduate students uh, an opportunity to reflect on the fact that maybe the way they learn best is not the way the students learn best. Yes, I think that's true as well. And our students benefit so much from this program, because our undergraduates, because the TAs are really only a year or two beyond the undergraduates and they're, they have a rapport with the students that I won't achieve. I'm, you know, I'm the mother figure, right? I'm the age of their mothers. I have children in college. And so they might um, interact with me in, you know, they want to get information from me. They can, you know, even about, not just about biology, but about, you know, career choices, etc. But in general, I don't think they feel very comfortable talking to me about, you know, I tried this study strategy and it didn't work. And talking to somebody else who's just been through that is a lot more effective. So they are um, a really important conduit for our students to actually um, open up and explore things other than just, you know, the actual facts that we're teaching them in biology, but how to learn those facts, how to start thinking about the concepts. Okay. One of the things about big classes is that, as you've mentioned, there are lots of barriers to doing things that are interactive, that you really do have to think in innovative and creative ways. However, technology has been somewhat helpful in right. that regard. And again, you were one of the pioneers to try out the anteater response system, or the clickers, as a lot of people call them. Right. What sort of impact has that had? Well, that was really, um, we started using them the second year that we had actually started the interactive program in the large classroom. The first year, we um, used the technique you taught me, which was mm -hmm. to hold up little cards when we asked students <laughs> questions. You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you have a yellow card for mm -hmm. a answer A, blue card for answer B. And that worked relatively well, but our students are of a di different generation. Mm -hmm. They are um, more in tune with the technology, and so we, st we tried one of the um, early clicker systems, we were not very happy with it because of technical difficulties. But the new one that we have, which is the radio frequency one, that it works extremely well, and by that I mean the students' responses are recorded accurately and rapidly. And so they feel confident that what they clicked in is actually what's recorded. And how this affected my teaching and the students is very different than how I thought it was going to. So it clearly, um, I use it for a variety of things. I use it as an engagement tool. I have a wait, wait, don't tell me NPR type question at the beginning of every lecture that ties some, something in biology news to what we're gonna do in the lecture today. And the first thing you'll notice in the class is um, students come in and they're just sitting around it's open for about it it closes one minute after the class starts and so they um click in they're talking sometimes they're talking about that and sometimes they're talking about <laughs> something else there are students that walk into the classroom like this they don't even look <laughs> they just click because they want their click registered but when we go over the answer and i tell them the correct answer a huge cheer always goes up from those who got the correct answer, whether they actually knew it or if they just guessed. Um, so that starts off the classroom, uh, the class with, I think, a reasonable amount of energy, engagement, and they're set to go. And they know that this signals the start of the class. 
The second thing is we use it throughout the lecture to um, set up what might be a misconception. So I give them a question about something that I know they don't really understand based on my previous classes. Mm -hmm. And then I try and teach them the material and then I get, give them a chance to answer that question again. That really helps them um, you know, connect, oh, this is what I thought and this is what I think now. But the most important thing is that they want to see the distribution of responses more than they want to see the correct response. And why do you think that is? Because they want to know where they fit in. And this, st I, I started getting an inkling of this early on because it was often that they don't, didn't really care if they got the answer right or wrong. They want to know that they're in the same crowd as the majority of the people. And then when, they, when there are four answers and it's evenly distributed among the four, then everybody's happy. Mm -hmm. If there are 60% that get one answer, wrong or right, and there's you know, the other 40% are distributed among the other answers, they're okay with that. It doesn't matter if it was wrong, they're okay with that. So I thought, well, this is kind of interesting. So then I gave some questions that there would be no reason that I thought that they would need to know the answer. It wasn't biology. I was asking some, you know, sort of, uh, they were administrative type questions. Mm -hmm. And one of them was um, about students' perception about education abroad programs, because I was trying to gather some information. And I had three questions. I wanted to slip them in, go through them quickly. So I put up the first one, and I, they clicked in, and then I um, went to put up the second one. They said, What's the distribution? <laughs> I'm like, do you, do you really care? You've trained them. Oh, well. yeah. No, they <laughs> want to see the distribution. And so now I take these clickers, not just to my undergraduate classes, I go all over, all over the country and use these in teaching other faculty, TAs, etc. And that is the first thing they want to see is I do, I ask um, a very, um, general question always at the beginning, sort of about if it's um, a group of people from biotechnology, I ask, you know, how many years since you last took a biology class? And so, you know, there's nothing writing on this, yet they all want to know where everybody else in the class is. And so I just did it to a group in a lifelong learning class. The average age was 85 oh my. years old. And the first thing they asked me, I don't, I don't naturally, I just don't show the distribution straight away. I say, we, I, I can show, uh, this is the, you know, this is, you know, these are, we can show correct answers. This one doesn't have a correct answer. It's just a, a survey. And, but do you want to see the survey? Oh, yes. <laughs> so it is not limited to undergraduates, to faculty, to TAs. It is, I think, general human nature that when you are in a group, you want to know where you fit within that group. And it's community building as it well, is. which is one of the problems with our large classes that students feel so anonymous yes. in them. So that's wonderful. Sounds like you're having great impact with that resource. What about other teaching techniques that you are about to try out or that you are using to great success? So one that um, has been really fun for me has been what we call it is um, our demonstrations. And this year we actually called them our garage demos. We <laughs> gave them actually a name. So about two years ago, we started doing physical demonstrations to illustrate dynamic biological processes. Because generally we teach biology with two dimensional slides mm -hmm. and there's nothing in biology that's static. There is just nothing. And so a two-dimensional slide really does not represent the biological processes we want our students to understand. So we, I made a few demonstrations out of just things I have in my house or most particularly in my garage <laughs> because my children are older, toys have migrated out to the garage and PVC piping, netting, um, nails, uh, styrofoam balls, those are the things that are mm -hmm. out in my garage. And we use these uh, objects to illustrate 
the dynamic nature of different biological processes. And what, so I started the first year I did, I think two or three, so in the quarter, had two or three demonstrations. And in the free response comments when you get your student evaluations, mm -hmm. those were commented on most heavily mm -hmm. of, of, as to what students liked. So the next year, last, uh, a year ago, I decided to add in a demonstration for almost every other lecture. And these are things that are, you know, I use a huge piece of hose to demonstrate a plasmid. So it, the, the nature of these has to be big enough that they can be seen at the back of the classroom. They can be done in a one to three minute period and they illustrate something that you can't easily illustrate on a slide. Mm -hmm. And they have to connect with the students and they connect an ordinary everyday object with something I'm trying to teach them. And so it, it, it helps them organize this information in their brain, which is coming in at a huge rate. And organizing it is m very important to first remembering it and secondly understanding it. And so I got a, um, then I got a huge number of comments and my co-teacher at the time also introduced some uh, demonstrations that said those were the best thing. So this year we had a demonstration for every single one of our classes. We have 30 or 28 classes in the quarter. Every class had a demonstration and we videotaped them and then put up short video clips on YouTube where the students could go and review those concepts. And then mm -hmm. we also um, did surveys to ask them how they use them, what, did, what helped them. And that was, again, the demonstrations get the very largest um, comments from the students. And they go all the way from, uh, they really help me understand the, comment, uh, the concepts. I visualize these when I'm uh, studying to ones where I use um, socks to illustrate chromosomes during mitosis. And I, one of the comments says, every time I fold my laundry, I think about mitosis. <laughs> and, and that is, and they actually, in my comments this year, we just named them garage demos this year. In my comments this year, they all refer to them as my garage demos. And having a, a, a little name that they identify with you in your class is also community building because yes. it's sort of your your bio speak or your O'Dowd speaks, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Well, one thing we did this year that I also thought worked really well, we, we started out saying we wanted to build a community. We put our students in fixed groups of four to six students. They stay there the whole quarter, interact. And the last day, um, it's a cell biology class, uh, cell biology and development, and very introductory, but we start out with a cell and we end up with the nervous system where it's a collection of cells all put mm -hmm. together. And so we made the analogy in the class, they started out all as individuals, they came in, they formed little groups, like little um, clusters of neurons, and in the end, they formed a whole nervous system all connected. And so our last exercise was each group drew a neuron. And then I took all their cards, pasted them together in a huge neural network, and tried to really bring home the fact that they started out as 444 individuals in this class. And they have finished this class as a neural network where each of these groups has interacted in some way or another with each other group because they've spoken up in class, they've interacted in their small groups, or they've interacted with us as faculty and we've interacted back with the class. And that, I was a little bit, um, I was not sure if they would think this was hokey, whatever, so I, I spent all night seriously pasting all these cards together and I did them in order for each class, so I have two classes, so there were 86 cards for each class because there were six four to six people per, per group and 86 cards. And I had put them in order so then they could identify themselves. And then I had to photograph it at high enough resolution that they could, if they expanded it, they could actually see their, not only their neuron, but they all signed their neurons. <laughs> and so, so then I, you know, I stayed up to like three o'clock in the morning doing this. I, and then when I showed it in the class, 
it, there was a huge round of applause, and I thought it was really worth it. I, I, I was thinking they might think, ah. So that's an example of doing something where 10 years ago I never, ever would have tried that. Five years ago, I might have thought about it, but it would have said, no, too risky. And this time I just said, I'll try it. If they don't like it, if they all say, oh, that's stupid, <laughs> then I wouldn't do it the next year. It sounds like you've managed to do a number of things in your teaching, and one is certainly building a learning community, which we know is important. Yeah. You're also connecting things to everyday objects that they know, and we certainly know that part of learning is connecting what you already know to what you don't know. Right. You've made it interactive so that the students are actually engaging with the subject matter. And you've made it authentic in that you're, you're trying to bring it down to what biologists really do. You've gone from these two dimensions to more of the three-dimensional objects in class. And as a result, you have very engaged students. You are certainly very engaged. So it sounds like you've been very successful with your interactive teaching. Yeah, well, one of the things that I uh, um, in talking to other faculty about, you know, would you want to try this, or um, would I change and go back to the way I used to teach? And what I can tell every faculty that I talk to with certainty is the people, all of the faculty I've worked with that have tried inter uh, interactive techniques would also all say, I think, to varying degrees, it's a lot more work to a little bit more work to begin with, mm -hmm. and not one of them that I know of would say, I'm not going to do it anymore. Because Impressive. it is way more rewarding. There are lots of people that don't want to try it, that never try it. But once you try it, it is, we are all, or, and my, uh, my profession, we're all scientists. We do experiments <laughs> and expect to get results. and. I do experiments on living neurons because I'm an impatient person. And in a, a living neuron, I put an electrode in it and it spikes and it does something right there. And so I get the result. I don't run gels because you know you have to pour it, you have to put the stuff on the gel, and then you have to wait overnight. And so, uh, but it used to be that we would teach our students and then five weeks later we'd find out did they learn anything because they take a test. And that's just not who we are as people, as biologists, as scientists, we are always looking for the result, except in our teaching, we weren't. So I have found it enormously more rewarding and interesting. And so I do think that I um, invest more in it now than I used to invest in teaching, but that's definitely a personal choice. I could do it now with no more investment than I used to in a standard didactic class, but I would never do that. I would never go back to a standard didactic class. I just, um, it would not be rewarding or interesting for me. And so if it's not, if I bore myself, I just can't imagine what I'm doing to the students, <laughs> which is really the way I was feeling in my large classes that I had been teaching for a long time. Well, thank you, Diane. It sounds like you've been successful for yourself as a teacher as well as for the students. Yes.